going up. Going up on the mountain. I ain't coming down till morning. I'm going up. Hi. Hi, I'm Linda Berger and I'm senior program manager for Livestock Conservancy and today we're at the D'Artagnan Foundation Farm with Ariane Degas, the owner of D'Artagnan Foods and goose expert extraordinaire oh. and we're very excited to be here and today we're going to talk a little bit about um, the geese that she comes from uh, in her section of France. Uh, which is south of France, uh, near oh, yeah, yeah. And um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and how you got into geese? Um, so my name is Dagen, Ariane Dagen. I come from a family of restaurateurs, seven generations that we trace back, having a restaurant in the heart of Gascony, Roche, the capital of Gascony. Uh, my father had the Hotel de France, two uh, Michelin star restaurants. And um, I learned very, uh, almost a baby, how to uh, eviscerate the duck or a goose and plug them and cook them and uh, make a nice big foie gras out of them mm -hmm. and do the coffee. Uh, hence the mushrooms, it's mostly porcini steppe in mm -hmm. that region. Um, but also the mousseron in the spring, that is the one that is cooking. Uh, and to cook everything with duck fat and goose fat. That's what we do there. Yeah. In Gascony, we don't, we don't live, we don't eat to survive. We eat, we, we live to eat. <laughs> and in Gascony, seriously, when you not only you go uh, knock at the door, the first word when they open the door is not hello. The first word is have you eaten? That's the, you know, is the first thing. So that's where I come from. And um, I came to America almost 40 years ago. That's a long time. I, I live longer here than in France. Mm -hmm. Like friends. Yes. Uh, and, um, uh, and I, I started D'Artagnan. Uh, 35 years ago. We just celebrated the anniversary in February, end of February, just before the COVID uh, crisis. Very lucky because everybody came. We had like 2,500 coming from France, Gascony, rugby players, winemakers, mm -hmm. uh, farmers, friends, schoolmates, uh, musicians. Yeah. And for and folks that uh, think D'Artagnan sounds familiar, that's the name of the fourth musketeer. Yeah. And uh, he's from Gascony. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, they really existed, eh? all four of them. And D'Artagnan really did great things in life. Not exactly like the book or the movie, but he mm -hmm. did great things for his uh, king, for his queen, and for the community. The guy liked to do things not for the what's in it for me, but for the uh, impact that he could make on the community. And because of that, uh, I chose his name for my company uh, because I hope to think that the mission of D'Artagnan, the food company in America, is about that. It's about, of course, we need to be profitable. We need to... Uh, well, I guess we have to talk louder. The, the other fan uh, yeah, is still yeah, going yeah. from... We had a beautiful lunch. <laughs> Just before we got on here, so we'll have to speak a little louder. Okay. okay. <laughs> Is that better? Okay. okay. So, so he really existed. He was a hero. He's a hero among all the Gascon people in Southwest France. When you say D'Artagnan, everybody, yeah, I'm a descendant of D'Artagnan, <laughs> which might be true. He was a very active guy, but still, <laughs> you know, we're all very proud of our uh, yeah. heritage and of the fact that he's our champion uh, mm -hmm. in Gascony. So my company, D'Artagnan Food, um, the mission after him, our mantra is all for one, one for all, which helped us a lot during COVID, seriously, because yeah. all the employees, everybody worked together to switch, to pivot, you know, to, uh, mm -hmm. to change the uh, lane, to be able to survive and continue. And, uh, but all for one, one for all is not a vain word. It's really 
uh, the way we think of society in general. Mm -hmm. Like a rugby game or like a football game, you know, if one guy is missing, if one element is missing, then the whole thing falls apart. We need to be together to, uh, to be able to achieve uh, uh, great things. Well, can we talk about another famous citizen of Gascony, in, uh, the Toulouse Goose? And you have started a flock here on the farm, mm -hmm. and um, that uh, you know the Toulouse goose has a rich history. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how the goose actually saved the the um, regional capital from invaders. Right, that's right. a great story. Yeah. So we do have you know how people have manipulated genetics from the Middle Ages or before, you know, trying to find the best gander to go with the best hen and trying to do the best babies possible. And so from that, there is this uh, strain of geese in Gascony um, with one that's called the Masseub, the Loi de Masseub, uh, goose from Masseub, um, which is a the strain in the strain of the Toulouse goose, which is a very famous gray goose, very imposing. The gander is super strong, super aggressive um, with strangers. And geese in general, I mean, I'm sure you've talked about that before, but they are very, very smart animals and they don't um, take food from strangers. So unlike um, unlike a dog, a dog would bark away and then you throw a stick at the dog and all of a sudden the dog is your best friend. Geese will not do that. They will, they will be very aggressive whether you try to feed them or not. They don't know you, you're the enemy. So for that, they are the best guard. And that's how at the NASA, for example, in uh, Texas, um, they chose geese to guard the perimeter instead of uh, dogs. Really? Yeah. And the history says that the Romans, and I don't know if it was a Toulouse goose or if it was a Roman goose, probably a Roman goose because it was in Rome, mm -hmm. um, they were guarding the capital. And at night, the Gauls, us, our ancestors, we tried to go and invade the capital, the geese wake up, and then the geese woke up the whole army of Romans mm -hmm. who crushed us. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. we, uh, we should have known better. You know, geese are really, really good uh, guardians. And so they guard the Capitol in Rome and they were successful. But now when you see the, the insignia of Toulouse, it's very clearly a goose. They're yes. very proud of their, their yes. geese there. And, Actually, tonight the goose we're going to be cooking tonight is a Roman goose. Roman goose. Yeah. And yeah. so for our, our class, my goose is cooked class tonight, uh, we'll get to see and, and try how a Roman goose uh, right. finishes up. It's pretty close. Eh? It might be a strain also of that to lose a goose. It's that gray, you know, with a little bit of black on the wings, but yeah. mostly gray with that big belly in front, especially in the fall when they are ready to migrate. Yeah. Supposedly, if they were wild, and when they start to grow that liver inside, that's yeah, yeah. yeah, that's yeah, you know, what we do with sauter. <laughs> yeah, sauter. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. So um, we were on a farm the other day and, and talking about geese and how they um, they're big grass eaters. Um, I saw this morning that you, you all the geese are out on the grass, but you also bring the uh, kitchen scraps, and right. they wouldn't take any from me, but they took it from you. Yes, yes. Um, so what are you feeding them, basically? If they've got all this grass, say in the summertime when there's plenty of grass and bugs, do they really need supplemental food or just a little bit? Or? So this is pretty recent for us. Uh, they were born in May, so mm -hmm. we just saw them growing all summer. Now they are fully adult. Mm -hmm. um, what I can tell you is that we have the feeder. We do put grain in there. And I don't know who it's most, if it is the geese or if it is the wild birds that are coming constantly and uh, feed at the, uh, 
the grain feeder. Yeah. Uh, but you can see them, I mean, they are constantly, uh, like chicken a little bit, then, but they are constantly picking and eating grass, constantly. Mm -hmm. And we put the uh, winter garden in the middle of their, you know, with a little electronet of their uh, parkour, of their uh, uh, pasture. And um, they happen to love, there is one thing they really love, it's the uh, turnip greens. Yeah. That they uh, they have a difficulty uh, refusing from anybody. <laughs> so, yeah, and I saw they were actually pecking at a turnip today. You put the whole turnip yeah, in there and yeah. they were working their way through it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that was surprising yeah. for me. Yeah, I knew yeah. the greens, but the actual turnips, I didn't think a, a goose would be interested in. Yeah, they are very picky eater. You know, the chickens, you bring the uh, the, the, the the kitchen uh, scraps of vegetables, chicken will eat everything, literally everything. I mean, there are very little things that they don't eat, right? Like uh, yeah. orange peel or something like that, or maybe avocado peel. But everything else they know. These, not so much. You have to try and see what they say. Like, I tried leek. Leek was not a great champion there. Yeah. No, but turnip is a big one. Yeah. yeah. Now, eating geese are a big part of your, your, your lifestyle and your heritage. Um, what is the preferred method for um, cooking geese in Gascony? And like, what is the, so, do you have a national dish with yeah, you? Yes, or? in Gascony, we confit everything. Mm -hmm. And confiting means cutting in pieces and uh, drying in salt overnight, then uh, taking the salt out and then putting those pieces in goose fat from last time and simmering them slowly. And that allows, and that's from before electricity, before the middle age, that is typically what we do to keep pieces of meat, meat protein all winter long. Because once you do that and you cook in that fat for an hour and a half, it's not fatty, you know, it's rich, but it's not fatty at all. It's just that the fat will protect after that. You put in a jar, you cover it with a hot fat, and you put this in a cool cupboard, and that's how you survive with meat protein all winter long. That's what Gasco have been doing forever. Mm -hmm. um, now for Christmas, we tend to do the whole goose because the presentation is so much better, you know. Uh, and that's what we're going to do this evening. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Yeah. And, but this evening we're borrowing a recipe from Lyon, from Bresse exactly, the other side of France. Mm -hmm. So Gascony is southwest, southwest is facing you, we have France facing you. The Pyrenees are there, the Atlantic Ocean, the Mediterranean, and the Pyrenees. That's Gascony right there with Toulouse and Osh, the capital. And then you go straight there, you have the Riviera with uh, Marseille and Nice. And then you go up a little bit and you have Lyon. So it's there. Bresse is right there, right up uh, Lyon. And there they have a big tradition of poultry also, more in the chicken, capon, poulet de bresse, and they are very, very uh, uh, peculiar about their poulet de bresse and keep the breed really pure, and they, are, and they have this tradition of making them really nice, ready to go in the oven. Uh, they finish them with uh, bread with milk, especially the capons. Yeah. And so there, for Christmas, they have those big birds, even the chickens are no, no less than five pounds and a half, six pounds. The capons are 10 pounds. And so, but they have turkeys too. And so there, all the chefs, and that has been adopted by all the French chefs in France now, when you have big birds like that, you the day before you poach it, and then the day off, you finish just by roasting it and by crisping the skin on top. And that does, something very, very uh, formidable, which is that even if you mess up, even if you overcook during the roasting, it's going to be super moist inside, always. And thanks to that, it's a great recipe. And a, a, a side uh, uh, bonus to that recipe is the broth you end up, you end up with. Yep. That makes the best soups 
It's super suit. Super suit. From what I've heard. Super yeah. Suit. yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> well, do we have any questions that have come in? We do. Let's see. Shelly wants to know, at what age should a goose be butchered for the best carcass? Mm -hmm. um, it probably differs from breed to breed, but she wanted to ask anyway. To me, it has to be at least six months. So a goose naturally uh, will be born end of April, beginning May. And so it's not by chance that people decided to cook a goose for Christmas. It's mm -hmm. because that's when it's ready. So now if you miss it or you have too many geese and you want to keep some for later, that's fine. I mean, they're going to get older, they're going to get fine. If they get really, really old, then you do have to make comfy, nothing else, mm -hmm. because comfy is a way to mellow out the, uh, the flesh and the muscles. Yeah. Um, but I would say six months is a perfect uh, when they are naturally born April, May, you eat them for Christmas. Okay. Right. Thank you, Shelly. Audrey says her geese like to snack on what her chickens eat, otherwise they eat the grass. And yeah. Shelly also says hers love apples, tomatoes, peppers, fruits, greens. Mm -hmm. Now here you're you're mixing your geese with ducks. Do you they don't seem to you have any problems getting along? Do the ducks stay clear of them, or there is a picking order? Yeah, clearly there is a picking order. When we put them with the chickens, also there is a yeah. picking order, and and clearly it's the biggest one to the smallest one. You know, so you have the geese, the duck, and then the chicken, and we, even within the chicken you have a picking order. Yeah, the big ones and then the small ones. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, but, but they respect each other. I mean, it's not they're not going to kill each other. You know, they they just don't mess up with the goose when the goose has something to do in that territory. You know? Yeah, and they yeah. all know that. They all know that. Yeah, we were having fun this morning talking about how to sex geese, and we were playing uh, some advice that Gerald Donnelly had given me once when we were out visiting uh, Good Shepherd Farm and. Um, easy way to tell males from females is, uh, especially with the Toulouse, is their, um, their calls. And the females do this wah, 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 according to Gerald, and then the, the males do a wah. <laughs> and when we were out there listening, sure enough, you know, we hear the wah, wah, wah. And uh, we're going to try and post that video uh, with Gerald on our YouTube channel so you can hear that for yourself because it very it is very distinct and usually he said the mated pairs call to each other so if you hear that wah 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 the first one that goes wah that's the guy he's the guy, he's he's the the guy. guy. <laughs> in Gascogne we to talk to the geese we have a worm the worm is bivou uh -huh. so we try to keep the reason in which the the goose just talk to us yeah. And if it's a wow, then we say bidu. And if it's a wah, 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 then we say bidu, bidu, bidu. And, oh. and try it. Try it with any gear. Yeah. I promise you the answer. The answer to, I think, bidu, bidu, bidu is kind of naturally their, their voice. Mm -hmm. But also try to keep the same rhythm than what they just said. You know? And they, no, no, but seriously. <laughs> and then you see them come down and looking at. I feel like, but you're not a goose, you know? Yeah, like, <laughs> on. Okay, we'll have to try that. <laughs> Actually, look, stay tuned for video. <laughs> so we'll have to do that later today and then post that. Um, do we have other questions? We have a couple. Looks like somebody back home wants to know what are the best flavors to use when cooking goose? So, if you do just simply roast it, if you don't poach it first, mm -hmm. then you don't forget to prick the skin with a, with a fork or, or score the skin on the breast with a knife. Not to the flesh, eh? simply to the skin, because web-footed animals, ducks and geese, natural migrants, store calories during migration or just before migration in two places. One is the skin, you know, under the skin, that's where the fat goes, and the other one is the liver, that's the foie gras. Mm -hmm. The foie gras when it's cold and they are ready to migrate. But the skin 
is also used as a fat receptor and a recipient. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For um, because they're gonna they are big birds. They're gonna take a while to take off. They're gonna take a while to you know. It takes them so to prevent predators and to really try to protect themselves. It's better during migration to do a non-stop flight. Seriously, at a as high as possible and as long as possible without any stops on the way. So in order to do that, to be at those high altitudes, you need that layer of fat to insulate you against the cold up there. Mm -hmm. And that's what the skin does, and that fat under the skin does. That's the only, the web-footed animals, ducks and bees, those are the only animals that you need to prick or to score the skin in order to get the crisp skin and you're going to have extra fat in the pan, no doubt. The liquid but gold. Right. Your husband said. <laughs> That's right. That's yeah. right. But, but you don't do that with a pheasant. You don't do that with a quail, with a squirrel, with a chicken. Mm -hmm. Only with those web-footed animals. Yeah. And then the second place where they store calories is the liver, which in that animal, in those web-footed animals, ducks and geese, happens to be directly in the middle of the body, not on the lower right, like if you have any doctors on the, in the room right now, like they, they're going to tell us, you know, that any animal or any human beings have the liver right there, lower uh, right, whereas geese and ducks, no, right in the middle, because as the liver expands and takes calories, and up to a lot of, I mean, it could go up to a pound and a half, eh? a liver that is usually barely three ounces. It's important to be in the middle of the body because you're going to migrate. You know, if it's down and to the right, then you're going yeah. to go home. Yeah. That doesn't work. Well, I found it really interesting last night when we were looking at the Roman goose we're going to prepare today. You were really surprised at how big the liver was. And this is an animal that's yeah. never been, you know, they're not force fit. They're right. on pasture. They're, you know, they're living the life. But it's getting cold out. And that yeah. animal naturally was putting it's on hot. the calories and when it was butchered this past weekend, it had this big, beautiful liver that you could make pate or, yeah. or you yeah. know, all kinds of things with. And uh, I think that's something that, that people don't understand is, you know, you can still have a, a beautiful liver without, you know, doing that, that cramming. If you're raising your own geese, it's certainly something you don't want to throw away. And it seems you have to wait until it gets cold. Totally, yeah. totally. Yeah. You have to wait until it's time to migrate if they were in the wild, because that's when it starts to get cold and they start to eat more mm -hmm. naturally on their own. We did not invent anything. Man did not invent gavage. The geese and the ducks invented gavage. That's what they do to themselves before migrating. Mm -hmm. That's why they have an insensitive esophagus, mm -hmm. and that's why they have this liver in the middle instead of uh, down to the side. Now, uh, not all of them are going to make for on their own. Mm -hmm. If you have, if you're going to uh, yeah. uh, process and sacrifice some geese for uh, Christmas, you'll see some will have eaten more than others. Yeah. What man has been trying to do all these years is without stress, giving them the same amount of food that is for migration so that they do get that big foie gras and liver inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do we have some more? Uh, we do. Questions? So Vivian wanted to know, how do you prepare goose for poaching before roasting? You talked about pricking the skin already. Do you poach for a certain amount of time or a certain temperature? So if you poach, you don't prick the skin. Ah. Uh, I think number one, you should be part of the cooking. Yeah, the cooking <laughs> class. <laughs> What time is the, the Zoom? Uh, we start at 4.30 tonight. 4.30, yeah. so please you know, give them the link to the, uh, yeah. uh, to the Zoom so you'll have it more in detail. We're going to spend an hour poaching and then cooking the goods. Mm -hmm. But there is nothing, uh, nothing difficult other than you need a pot big enough to fit that baby in there. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Otherwise, you know, you're good. Yeah. All right, um, let's see.
Baka wants to know, can you raise geese, ducks, and fish in the same pond? Yes, uh, the fish are not going to be very happy, but... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, be careful. I mean, it's life. Life is a, a balance, you know? You need a biotope. You need an organic way of living, killing, decomposing, becoming something else and, and going around. Now, if you really, really want to keep the fish for yourself and to fish, then uh, be careful, you know? Yeah. Be careful. They're going to eat fish because their esophagus is insensitive. They don't care if the thing is really big they don't care. They're going to swallow it. It's going to go in the jabot, the crop sack, right mm -hmm. there. And then they're going to go to shelter because, again, they don't have any uh, defense against predators. They are animals of prey. So that's why they have this crop sack right there. They will take, like a pelican or like, you can see, you know, photos of whole frogs or whole fish in a duck or in a goose neck uh -huh. or, or uh, yeah, neck. And then once it's in the crop sack, which is kind of the first stomach, then they go to shelter where they know they are protected. And there they start digesting and go in the second and real stomach, which is the gizzard. Mm -hmm. And that's why the gizzard is so big in those animals because they get big amounts of food at one time and then nothing for three or four days because hey, you don't they catch just a meal. Yeah. You don't catch a fish every day. Yeah, yeah. I think that was all the questions. I, I've seen ducks eating crawfish. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It's just to tell you how insensitive their uh, esophagus is. Yeah. It's trying yeah. to eat the crawfish with a shell and everything oh, and live. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking some time out. And uh, again, we're going to be having our class this evening and hope this will be posted on, on YouTube. And um, we look forward to uh, cooking this evening. Me too. Great. Thank you for um, coming all the way here. And yeah, I hope we're going to have a ball tonight. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks, folks, and uh, we'll see you next week.